Welcome to Lesson 12D, Approximation for Inviscid Regions of Flow. In this lesson, we'll define what we mean by an inviscid region of flow. We'll find that the Euler equation is applicable for these kinds of regions. I'll emphasize the difference between inviscid fluid and inviscid flow. I'll show you how you can derive the beloved Bernoulli equation from the Euler equation, and I'll do an example problem. Here's the definition of an inviscid region of flow. It's a region of flow in which net viscous forces are negligible compared to pressure and or inertial forces. But be careful with the nomenclature. Inviscid does not mean that the fluid itself has zero viscosity. All fluids have viscosity. However, in some regions of flow, net viscous effects can be negligible compared to inertial and or pressure effects. This is what we call an inviscid region of flow. I'll state it this way. We may have inviscid flows, but not inviscid fluids. Here's an example of where you might find inviscid regions of flow. Here's an airfoil at some angle of attack. I sketch some streamlines. Because of the no-slip condition, there will be a thin region near the wall where viscous effects are very important. And this extends typically into the wake as well. This region near the wall is called a boundary layer. Viscous effects here are important and cannot be neglected. The same thing is true in the wake. But anywhere else, outside the boundary layer and the wake, all around this airfoil, we can treat this as an inviscid region of flow. This, of course, is an approximation. Viscosity is always acting in these regions. It's just as I said in the definition. The net viscous forces are negligible compared to pressure or inertial forces. In the case of an airfoil, it turns out that we can solve the problem inviscidly and get a very good approximation of the lift, FL, provided that the angle of attack isn't so large that the flow over the wing stalls or separates. We'll talk in more detail about airfoils later on in a different lesson. Now let's look at the equations. We'll approximate the Navier-Stokes equation for an inviscid region of flow. Here's the Navier-Stokes equation in non-dimensional form, where I've labeled the five terms as in previous lessons. Recall that for the creeping flow approximation, Reynolds number was very small, and only the pressure and the viscous terms remain in the equation. For inviscid regions of flow, we have the opposite condition, namely that Reynolds number is much greater than one. That makes this viscous term negligible compared to the other terms, provided, of course, that we've properly normalized this Navier-Stokes equation. For inviscid regions of flow, then, the Navier-Stokes equation reduces to rho del v del t plus v dot del v equals negative gradient of p plus rho g, where I've gone back to the dimensional form of the equation. This is called the Euler equation. It's the Navier-Stokes equation without the viscous term. This is the approximate equation we solve in inviscid regions of flow. Keep in mind that this is an approximate equation, but it's easier to solve than the full Navier-Stokes equation, which is the whole reason we're doing this in the first place. And as I mentioned for the airfoil case, there are flows where this Euler equation is quite useful and can yield fairly accurate predictions. Now I'll show you how you can derive the beloved Bernoulli equation from the Euler equation. We had derived the beloved Bernoulli equation in a previous lesson. Now we'll do it a different way. We start with the Euler equation for steady incompressible flow. It's the same equation I just wrote out up here, but without the unsteady term. Now, recall a vector identity that you may or may not remember from math class. For any vector v, v dot del v is equal to del of v squared over 2 minus v cross del cross v. But we recognize del cross v as the vorticity vector, as discussed in a previous lesson. We use Greek letter zeta for vorticity. This grouping of terms is the same as this, so we rewrite this equation as del v squared over 2 minus v cross zeta equal negative gradient of p over rho plus g. Now I want to combine as many terms as I can in this gradient operator. This term can be written negative of the gradient of the quantity p over rho, since rho is constant for an incompressible flow. And the gravity term, when z is up and g is down, in Cartesian coordinates, the gradient of z is just unit vector k, and vector g is minus g in the k direction. So g can be written as minus g, gradient of z, 
or minus the gradient of gz, since g itself is a constant. Thus our above equation can be written as follows. Now let's combine all three of these terms with the gradient under one roof, so to speak. We have the gradient of the quantity p over rho, plus v squared over 2, plus gz, and moving this term over to the right, we have v cross zeta. This is still the Euler equation, but it's an alternate form. Now consider a streamline. We know that at any point on a streamline, by definition, v is tangent to the streamline. It's hard to draw this three-dimensionally, but zeta equal del cross v will be in some other direction. And then the vector v cross zeta will have to be perpendicular to the streamline by definition of the cross product. In other words, v dot zeta is perpendicular to both v and zeta. Since this is the same as the right-hand side of our equation, and we're dealing with vectors, then the gradient of that quantity is also perpendicular to the streamline. Now I want you to think back to the definition of gradient. From your math class, you may remember that the gradient of any quantity b is in the direction of maximum change of b. And a corollary to that is that the gradient of b is 0 along curves or surfaces of constant b. Here let's let b equal what's in the parentheses in the above equation. And since that quantity is perpendicular to streamlines, the gradient of the quantity has to equal 0 along the streamline. We conclude that the quantity in parentheses p over rho plus v squared over 2 plus gz is constant along a streamline. This is the beloved Bernoulli equation. We've seen this before and we've derived it now three different ways. We showed that it's a degenerate form of the energy equation. We derived it by using the linear momentum equation and now we've derived it by using the Euler equation. All three derivations give the same beloved Bernoulli equation. Now let's do an example problem. We have a fluid that's rotating as a solid body or solid body rotation. The angular speed is omega which is perpendicular to the r theta plane. This flow is steady, and we're going to ignore gravitational effects. We're asked to generate an expression for the pressure field. I'll start by sketching the flow. This flow is solid body rotation, so the streamlines are concentric circles. If r is our horizontal axis and u theta is our vertical axis, u theta starts at zero and grows linearly with radius. In fact, we know the velocity field, u theta is omega r, ur equals zero and uz equals zero, where z is into or out of the page. Since the fluid moves as a solid body, there are no viscous forces. In other words, fluid particles do not rub against each other. They all move in lockstep as a solid body. So the viscous terms in the Navier-Stokes equation are exactly zero. This is truly an inviscid flow. The entire flow field is an inviscid region, but this is a rare case where it's inviscid everywhere. Later on we'll talk about irrotational flows. This is a rotational flow, but it's an inviscid flow. For this flow then the Euler equation applies everywhere, not just in inviscid regions of flow away from the wall. In fact there are no walls in this flow. So let's use the Euler equation to solve this problem. I'll list some assumptions and approximations. The flow is steady. We ignore gravity. I note here that gravity could be considered in the z direction but that won't affect our solution for p as a function of r. Our third assumption or approximation is that u theta is a function of r only, and p is a function of r only. Here's our Euler equation. This flow is steady, and we're ignoring gravity because of 1 and 2, respectively. And now we can solve this equation. In this problem, we know u theta, so we don't need to solve for it, and we'll actually use the r component of the Euler equation to solve for pressure. In cylindrical r theta coordinates, the r component of this equation reduces to del p del r equal rho u theta squared over r. The viewer can show this by writing out these terms in cylindrical coordinates and applying these approximations and assumptions. But notice that p is a function of r only, and thus we can rewrite this using total derivatives, and u theta is omega r so dp dr simplifies to rho omega squared r. This is easily integrated with respect to r. We get rho omega squared r squared over 2 plus some constant c1. We'll let p equal p sub 0 at the origin. In other words, where r equals 0. 
This is a boundary condition, which when plugged into our equation, you'll see 1 equal p naught, and thus p equal p naught plus rho omega squared r squared over 2. This is our desired answer. A quick comment here, as we increase r, we can see that p increases because of this term. So there's a higher pressure here than here. That makes sense because for a curved flow like this, there must be a centripetal acceleration towards the middle, that is, towards the center of curvature. The pressure difference, or the pressure gradient, is what causes this centripetal acceleration. Finally, let's examine this problem in terms of the beloved Bernoulli equation, which I rewrite here. By assumption 2, we neglect gravity, and v squared is omega squared r squared for this solid body rotational flow. Multiplying all the terms by rho, we get p plus rho omega squared r squared over 2 equal constant along a streamline. Now let's compare this with our solution for p from up here. We had this equation from above, and this equation can be solved for p as well, namely p equal minus rho omega squared r squared over 2 plus the constant along a streamline. I keep writing that out because this constant will be different on different streamlines. So this is a second equation for p. If we equate these two equations, this constant along a streamline, which some people call the Bernoulli constant, turns out to be p naught plus rho omega squared r squared when we combine these two terms. Thus our final Bernoulli equation, from here plugging in the constant, we get p equal minus rho omega squared r squared over 2 plus p naught plus rho omega squared r squared, which reduces to p naught plus rho omega squared r squared over 2. This agrees with our previous solution, so we're happy about that. Finally, I just want to mention that this so-called Bernoulli constant is really not a constant, it's a function of r, but it is constant along any streamline. The so-called constant changes from streamline to streamline. In this case, the Bernoulli constant gets bigger as we increase radius. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.